welcome Marjorie Jones, who is the author of the first biography of Francis Yates, um, entitled Fra Francis Yates and the Emetic Tradition, and was published in 2008. Um, and also the author of a recently published biography of Philadelphia Quaker Mary War Walcott, published this year, 2016. <coughs> Um, Marjorie teaches history uh, for Villanova University College program, and today she is going to speak about Francis Yates, the inspired uh, historian. Thank you very much. Thank you. thank you, Francesca. And thank you, Richard, for your gracious invitation. It's a pleasure to be here. Good afternoon. Um, Francis Yates has strongly influenced my spiritual journey and it's obvious to me that she, that you, many of you, share at least one aspect of that experience as well, some aspect of that experience. Perhaps some explanation is called for regarding how an American lawyer, a latecomer to professional historiography, wrote the first biography of one of the 20th century's great European historians. Trained in the law, but floundering in a dreary career in trust banking, in my mid-40s, I decided to return to school to pursue a graduate degree in historical studies at the graduate faculty of the New School in New York City, where Eric Hobsbawm was a visiting professor. One of the first assignments was to choose to write a paper about the body of work of any noted historian. And when I mentioned to Professor Hobsbawm that recently I had read and been intrigued by Francis Yates's Giordano Bruno and the Hermetic Tradition, women's spiritual journeys interest me especially. He said to me, then you'll have to go to the Warburg Institute, to which I responded, what's the Warburg Institute? Imagine then how reassuring it was to me when I first read a vignette in Yeats's autobiographical fragments relating that when she first met Edgar Vind at a party in 1939, he was holding a copy of her study of Love's Labor's Lost and informed her that he was from the Warburg Institute, to which Yeats responded, What's the Warburg Institute? <laughs> Although she had been pondering it for some time, it was only in her later years that Yates began to put pen to paper and draft her autobiography. In the meantime, she was preoccupied with more scholarly projects. And it wasn't until nearly 20 years after her death that her autobiographical fragments they never got beyond the stage of fragments, were published in 1999 by Rutledge at the end of a collection of her essays entitled Ideas and Ideals of the North European Renaissance. In that same summer of 1999, I arrived at the Warburg and met irascible Joseph Trapp, Yeats's surviving literary executor. When he informed me that there were two Yates family trunks in the basement of the Warburg and asked if I'd like to look through them, of course the answer was yes. And although interested initially in exploring the relationship of the hermetic tradition to tarot cards, the subject of Francis Yates's last article for the New York Review of Books, as they say, the rest is history. Still a half century later, one lesson I learned in law school has stayed with me. In the very first week, one professor asked, what's the answer to every question? The answer is, it depends on who's telling, who's asking, who's been impacted, etc. Since I've become a biographer, this observation seems to me to apply aptly to the study of history as well. Indeed, what better example than interdisciplinary Warburgian history and the spiritually oriented, his, histor oriented historiography of Francis Yates? 
A recent article re regarding Yeats's Astraea is another example. The article contends that Yeats's childhood, quote, seems by all accounts to ha seems by all accounts to have been quite close to perfection. Another observer said that Francis Yates, quote, had no emotional life. But having combed through her diaries, I have a very different perception and maintain that beyond a lifetime of wrestling with very complex emotions, a remarkably isolated and lonely childhood profoundly influenced her world, her worldview and historiography. The last of four siblings, Frances Yates was born late in November 1899, 10 years after her nearest sibling, and as she noted poetically, at the cusp of the 20th century. Along with gender issues, this timing, I believe, is critical when seeking to understand her worldview and methodology. As Richard has noted, her only brother James, born in 1889, was killed in World War I. Her sisters Ruby and Hannah, called Nanny, were born in 1885 and 1887, and by the time Francis arrived, had launched their own careers away from home. Looking back, Francis observed, the 1914-15 war broke our family. As a teenager, I lived among the ruins. While her sisters were educated and made their way in the greater world, although like many other women in a wartime generation without men, neither married, and in the trunks among Ruby's papers, I found a, a photo of a very handsome young naval officer, presumably killed in the Great War. But young Frances was kept at home to comfort and accompany their domineering mother, with whom, to her father's annoyance, she shared a bed until she was 16. In a journal she kept in her teens, a remarkable first-hand adolescent testimony regarding the war years that merits publication in its own right, she occasionally noted having to, finish, having to hurry to finish writing before her mother came to bed, lest she would see what Francis had written, or lest she would demand to see what Francis had written. Except for a sporadic year or two of formal schooling, as Frances and her mother followed her father's various wartime postings in and around England, young Frances was tutored, for lack of a better term, by her mother, who taught her to read and write by having her copy long passages from novels. So even if she had been born a few months or years earlier, it is unlikely that Frances Yates would have been permitted to leave home for school. And of course, if she had been born male, she would not have been permitted to stay. Although she sat for, her qualify for the qualifying exam for Girton, where her sister Hannah matriculated, Frances failed to gain entrance because, as she said, she was too busy reading novels. Unlike emotionally wounded, but nonetheless self-sufficient older contemporaries, such as Vera Britton and Winifred Holtby, just 18 crucial months older than Frances. Both of these women served, of course, in the Great War, were old enough to serve in the Great War, and after returning to Oxford, went to London to seek their fortunes. Frances continued, however, to live at home, finally for many years at Claygate. There she was cared for, perhaps cosseted is a better word, by her mother and sisters, and with no need to earn a living or manage a household, she never learned either to cook or to drive. Yet even in her adolescent journal, we can see the beginnings of a burgeoning of a unique scholar. I love the study of history, and the thought of college life appeals to me greatly. 
Moreover, I feel that it will be good for me in more ways than one to leave home. It's just now occurred to me how awkward this sounds in an American accent. Please forgive I can't help the way I talk. Um, Mother has a very strong will, and I fear that unless I go away and get a chance of looking after myself, I shall become too dependent. She was 16. The question was whether I should go for English or history. I, at first, was inclined for English, but Nanny suggested that English is a thing I could study for myself, and also that I might become imbued with other people's criticisms and that I should lose my own opinions. Hannah's stories also cast light on the family ambiance. For example, in Dim Star, published in 1928, these are wonderful novels, one of the characters is a charming, precocious younger sister, obviously Frances. And with obvious reference to their mother, Hannah also described a household with, quote, an iron routine which could not be broken and complete incomprehension of any need to break it. Perfection demanded complete subservience from all within her realm. Frances, future Yeats biographers looking for context, there's so much more to ponder, should note as well other unpublished novels by Hannah, along with correspondence from young Jimmy Yates and diaries of her sister Ruby, who before returning home to care for their parents and Francis, uh, first served with the VAD in the Great War and then spent many years in uh, Africa as a missionary. By the time she was in her 30s and emerging as a recognized scholar, albeit still living at home with her parents, who accompanied her on her first research trips to the continent. Frances's journal, Yates's journal for 1936, when she was 36, reveals a bleak outlook. Misery at father talking. I wish I could get over this nervous misery. It is my own fault. I should have gone away and done some work in the world on the lives that God meant me to work upon years ago. It is my own confidence and pretense that has resulted in this complete degradation. I have almost destroyed myself now, but must people kill and destroy themselves in some way or another? I am merely a member of the unhappy human race. Yet by the end of her life, and looking back in the autobiographical fragments, here is how Frances Yates recalled, perhaps justified as a better word, more appropriate term, the same early experience. Owing to the curious set of circumstances whereby I missed the career bus early in life, I escaped any kind of natural educational formation, had no school tie, was free to follow wherever the lines of my research led me. This outsider position, which left me free, had also the disadvantage of making me, for many years, rather diffident. Unsure of my position, for I had no position until Florio, until Florio led me to Bruno, and Bruno led me to the Warburg Institute. Bruno at last. As Joseph Trapp observed, her groundbreaking book, published in 1964, was deeply personal. This is a quote from Trapp. Deeply personal. Like all Frances Yates's work, it is the first, work in, the first book in which she found her true voice. Here again, while taking into account other notable women who wrote about the Renaissance, I believe her family milieu and especially her father's views go a long way toward explaining Yeats's fascination with Bruno, Bruno's hermetic teachings. A self-taught and thoughtful man, James Yeats set a high moral standard for his family. His views on religion reflect the appeal to many Victorians of the Oxford movement. Before the First War, 
in a letter to his son who was away at school. James Yates wrote, I have read the life of St. Thomas and like it very much. As you are aware, I have much sympathy with the Roman Catholic Church. I believe with Benson that if we were all one faith, religion would control the world as it did to a very large extent before the Reformation. And here to prove a point, I can't resist sharing one of my and my Presbyterian husband's favorite passages from Yeats's early diary, in which adolescent Francis recounted a visit with a friend to a Presbyterian church. On Sunday, we went to church in the morning. I hate and loathe the Presbyterian service. The minister sitting up in a pulpit where the altar ought to be, as if he was God. Greasy elders sitting below him and flighty maidens singing in the choir. A smug and self-satisfied congregation sitting instead of kneeling for prayers. In this context, too, consider a, a re, consider in this context consider too a remarkable letter Francis Yates wrote in the midst of the Second World War to Philip Hughes, whose book *Rome and the Counter Reformation* she admired, lavishly describing Henri Quatre's reign, *Le Beau Temps*, as one of the most glorious periods of Catholic Christianity. That marvelous early. 17th century France. She then attached, as Richard noted earlier, um, an extraordinary postscript that understandably aroused some controversy. I am an Anglican who takes the historical view that the Nazi revolution of 1559 and all the miserable complications which ensued deprive me of part of my natural and native inheritance as an English Catholic. Yates also admired Catholic historian Christopher Dawson, whom she cited frequently in her lectures and books. In Understanding Europe, published in 1952, Dawson wrote, If we wish to understand our past and the inheritance of Western culture, we have to go behind the 19th century development and study the old spiritual community of Western Christendom as an objective historical reality. Again from the fragments. This is Yeats. It was my ideal to live protected in some quiet place, free to follow my own thoughts and reading. My ideal was a life of civilized leisure with opportunity for research and thought, for meditation and prayer, for movement towards some unidentifiable goal of creative achievement, perhaps poetic, perhaps some epic poem in which the sense of history would play a part. Yeats shared a sense of spirituality with her contemporary, American scholar Rosamond Tuve, who was in, mentioned a few minutes ago, with whom she corresponded. Tuve espoused intellectual discussions as the breath of life that reflected a, desi a desire for transcendence or divine revelation, and that uninterrupted attention to serious study was a form of worship. With frequent references to her spiritual history, Yeats also wrote about meditative reading and solitude as a cure for loneliness. Yeats and Tuve were just two of a cadre of women scholars attracted to Renaissance studies and Bruno's universalist worldview. Another reason for the attraction is that women scholars were more likely to speak only French or Italian, which Yeats taught herself and which naturally encouraged Renaissance studies. Whereas men in structured, disciplined, and traditional university study st settings studied Greek and Latin, and thus tended to focus more on the classics. Another American, Clara Longworth, Comtesse de Chambrun, 
also wrote about Florio and corresponded at some length with Yeats. Other scholars, such as Janet Spence, Dorothy Whaley Singer, at whose home Yeats met Vind at that party in 1939, archaeologist Eugenie Seller-Strong, Iris Origo, Isabella Frith Oppenheimer, and of course her great friend and confidant, Gertrude Bing, shared their passion. Although she studied at Cambridge, Elizabeth Sewell, founded of Bensalem College, founder of Bensalem College at Fordham University in New York, also corresponded with Yates. They met in the 1970s when Yates was on a lecture tour of the U.S. Two extensive tours she made uh, in the 70s also are worthy of further exploration. Sewell opined that Cambridge had not taught her how to think. Instead, she wrote, she regarded Bacon, Vico, and Coleridge as her true mentors. For added credibility and to disguise their gender, several scholars, such as I. Frith, were published using first initials only. And certainly, Yeats's massive correspondence with prominent 20th century women scholars merits publication. Some have suggested in the 19th century Attraction to the Middle Ages and the period before the Scientific Revolution, which Yeats labeled the Counter-Renaissance, was prompted by a love of literature and a mal de siècle brought on by the harshness of capitalism, industrialism, and stifling Victorian convention. Indeed, Frances Yeats loved the Pre-Raphaelites and wrote in her journal of her, quote, darling Rossetti, who exemplified a romantic worldview. She even suggested provocatively that the ghost in Hamlet was the voice of the old Catholic Church. For Francis Yates, Bruno's martyrdom was emblematic of the reaction against, the title of my paper, The Daring Spiritual Adventures of the Renaissance. In her introduction to Astraea, she noted she had spent almost a lifetime trying to understand a period which has always seemed not a dead past, but vitally important for present imaginative and spiritual life. As I read and reread Francis Yates's diaries, books, and lectures, it became apparent to me that her pursuit of the hermetic tradition was deeply entwined with her own spiritual journey, which permeates her writing. Accordingly, I believe it should not be either overlooked, discounted, or ignored. At her memorial service in 1981, Ernst Gombrich observed, what attracted her in these newly found trends was again the element of hope, the hope cherished by some of the best minds of the age, of healing the agonies of a divided Europe by rising beyond dogma to a higher truth, the hope which made Bruno write that true religion should be without controversy and dispute. What I want to bring out, Gombrich continued, are the moral qualities of her personality, qualities which must surely figure prominently in any future study of her life and work. I believe that if we wish to honor her memory, we just must not allow her life and times to represent another lost moment in history. So today, when my own country is awash with xenophobia on a good day, while Europe too is conflicted by a tidal wave of migration from the Middle East, and when buses are blown up by religious fanatics at the very door of her beloved Warburg Institute, the work of Francis Yates and the unifying potential of the hermetic tradition seem as relevant and promising to me as they were to Giordano Bruno in the 1500s, to Francis Yates in the 1900s, and to seekers over the centuries. Thank you.